Well, I tell you, man, it's it's cooking in, in Europe. I can tell you that right now. It's like Czechoslovakia numbers are double the U.S. Um, France is up above us. U.K. is above us. Belgium's off the chart. Netherlands off the chart high. Spain back to high. So it's going. And what I'm really curious about is what are some countries doing that keeps this from spreading like crazy and that the rest of us aren't doing, right? So my gut is... It's all about who the citizens are and what they feel like they have a right to do. Like, I think in a number of countries... I'm just really people, amused by your armchair uh, public health analysis right now. Yeah, but look at <laughs> look at what happens in a number of Asian countries where they, they had it first and they've shut it down. I know. Right? Well, there was an interesting article in The Guardian. What are they doing that's different than us, right? If you want to look up this article in The Guardian about Japan and what they did, um, it was sort of, I think it was The Guardian or maybe the BBC, um, about what Japan did. And they don't, I mean, they don't really know. Nobody really knows. Maybe it's the populace. Maybe it's the strain that's in that country. Or maybe it's what they did. Um, But what Japan did is... As you were just saying, they have a really strong tradition of wearing a mask the second you feel sick at all. And people have been doing that for so many years that it's mm. considered rude to not wear a mask if you mm. if you even have like the slightest sore throat or cold or anything. And so it's just so like automatic for them. And they think that that contributed hugely to stopping the spread. But who knows? Maybe it wasn't that at all. And that's just a coincidence. I know. It's just, it's so amazing. And it's so, it's it's very political, of course, in the United States. So, so let's talk you know, about I'm, investing stuff. Well, we are talking about investing 100%. Yeah, exactly. Because if this thing is going to continue for quite some time, then we are going to see some really serious um, currency issues happening. Because people are going to stay out of work. People are going to not be going to theaters. They're not going to be going to sporting events. They're not going to be doing a lot of the things that they were doing. And those businesses are on life support. And, and I mean, restaurants are on life support. The, to me, the idea of going into a restaurant and having dinner inside a restaurant is insane. I can't even imagine what people are thinking. And they're doing it. They're doing it all over. But nothing like the numbers they used to have. It's less than half right now. So um, we are going to, I mean, shoot, man, we're going to see more and more companies go under, more and more people on life support financially, and the demand to massively intervene in this is going to be overwhelming. If Biden gets elected and he gets a Senate with it, it's a done deal. They'll spend, I mean, they'll spend $3.3 trillion immediately, um, and I think they'll follow it up with more if they've got a mixed group in there in the United States, there's you know Trump is calling for a, a a big number, and McConnell in the Senate is not, and they're going to push something through. Something has to go through after the election <clears throat> because they don't want to wait for another election cycle and have everybody just go in the tank. Or, so, bottom line, what can happen with the currency is so. I mean, it's interesting from an academic point of view. How much can you print? In other words, right now, here, let me, let me give so you some So what statistics. you're talking about is, is putting an economic stimulus, printing mm-hmm. money printing into the money. economy, and right. how that's going to affect the currency itself. Right. So, for example, the government manipulates, in the United States, the government manipulates the consumer price index, which is what uh, Social Security is indexed to. It's what Medicare is indexed to. So a lot of prices are indexed to the consumer price index, and it's... Last year, it was the index raised prices, according to the index, 1.3%. Okay? So the problem with that is that last year, I, I may have my numbers slightly wrong, but you'll get the ballpark idea. Last year, we increased the money supply by 4.9%, which is mm-hmm. a classic definition of inflation. In other words, yeah, if you don't... Yeah, that's an interesting in, comparison with numbers, yeah. Yeah, if you, don't com, if you don't increase the wealth, right, the overall wealth is the same, 
and you increase the money supply by 4.9%, you've just de degraded your money by 4.9%. You haven't added any wealth. You can't print wealth as everyone from Argentina to Zimbabwe has figured out. Um, you can't do that. And I don't think our politicians are so naive as to think they can, but they've painted themselves into a corner. You know, you can't tax your way out of something like this. And it's just so much easier to print the money. And on top of that, the U.S. is the world's reserve currency. The U.S. dollar is the world's reserve currency, which means if the U.S. dollar is going down in value, that's injuring everybody else out there that has our money sitting in their bank vaults, mm -hmm. which they have by the trillions. And so they want to protect their own ability to compete in U.S. dollars, then they're forced to devalue their currencies. And Switzerland has done this. It's astonishing that the Swiss did it. But at some point, you start to realize against the euro that the Swiss franc is so powerful and so strong that nobody can buy Swiss chocolate. They can't buy Swiss watches. They can't come to Switzerland for a vacation because it just, in euros, costs an insane amount of money. So Switzerland went, we just can't keep doing that. So they devalued their currency. And you'll end up with this, this downward race of devaluations mm -hmm. in order to kind of stay with the dollar. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, how long does that last before these currencies are considered worthless? And I can tell you something. It, it's unbelievable. Zimbabwe, after they devalued their currency 75% and the World Trade Organization refused to lend them any more money, it took Zimbabwe 20 years before their currency finally completely failed. I mean, draconian measures work. Governments keep pushing it. And meanwhile, we have to be investors during this whole thing. And so I've been, I've been really looking at this, and it's scary like crazy. Um, so obviously, you're looking for something that will hold its value. And gold tends to be a currency that holds its value in times like this. Mm -hmm. Ray Dalio is strongly urging gold on people. And the problem with gold is that these governments, to keep you using their currency, have a history of confiscating your gold. Right? Hmm. You didn't know that? I didn't know that, no. Yeah, starting with the United States. Yeah, I remember there was something about that in the 70s when they... Like under Nixon or something, wasn't there? Didn't they? No, it was under FDR, 1933. FDR no. confiscated with an executive order. That's all it took. He didn't pass it through the Senate, nothing. He, f he did an executive order and collected all the gold in the United States. And <laughs> he bought it at $20 an ounce. And then once he had it all, he immediately revalued it at $35 an ounce in terms of repatriating gold back to uh, any nation that wanted to exchange dollars for gold. And what happened was all these European countries, countries around the world in 1934, sent their gold to America in exchange for these suddenly, you know, really nice return on their gold. They, all of a sudden, gold went from 20 to 35 bucks. They get 35 US dollars, and that looked like a super deal. People sent billions and billions and billions of dollars of gold over to the United States. Okay, fast forward to Nixon. At By that point in time, the United States had, had become the world's reserve currency under the Bretton Woods Agreement, where everyone would keep the, the currencies at the same level relative to gold, okay? So gold's 35 bucks still in 1971. The problem was there was 14, I, I don't know the exact numbers, 14 something, 14 tons, 14 billion tons, whatever it was, that we owed to these foreign governments who sent us their gold in exchange for $35, right? We owed all that gold. And they said, give it to us. And we only had three, whatever those are. We owed 14 and we had three. Okay. And so Nick, Nixon was like, well, we can't give you back your gold. And he didn't want to admit that. So they, he took us off the gold standard and said, okay, we're no longer redeeming gold for dollars. We won't do it. And that created, for the first time, I think in history, 
fully fiat currencies. That is no currencies anywhere in the world were backed by gold. You guys, if you enjoyed this video and you feel it was valuable in teaching you more about how to invest, hit the like button and please share the video with your friends. And if you want more investing content, subscribe to my channel. And don't forget to click the button on the screen. We got a free gift for you. Thanks again for watching.